Health and Human Services budget for the next two years included $3.5 billion of the state's budget surplus to fund a number of initiatives that seek to improve the lives of children and families in Minnesota. Senator Melissa Wickland, chair of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee, joins me now to talk more about it. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. This new law creates a new state agency, the Department of Children, Youth and Families. What was the impetus for this change? Well, I think over time we've learned that families uh, today have had a lot of struggles in trying to connect with all of the programs that could be helping them and their children. Um, and there's been a lot of um, discussion and work to analyze what would be a better structure um, to, to make it work better for families. So um, there was a, a report done um, two years ago about governance of early childhood. Um, but really this goes back even further. When I was a freshman, I carried a bill to establish a Department of Early Learning or Department of Early Childhood basically. Um, because we could see even, even 10 years ago that there were needs that weren't being met because the system is so complex. So um, it's really meant to put in place a, a better framework for families to be able to find the services they need, get access to them, have the people focused on um, helping families in the way that, that best suits their needs. Um, and um, DHS is a very large agency and right now um, this is a, a smaller component of it, uh, but by bringing together um, not only DHS but um, Department of Education programs that relate to early learning, um, there's one program from the Department of Health and then some from uh, Public Safety. Bringing them all together will allow us to take a holistic approach to um, how do we address um, children's needs basically in, in Minnesota. A dearth of affordable child care programs has been alarming policymakers for years. The surplus has allowed for additional investments in the child care assistance program as well as $316 million for Minnesota's Great Start program. Will these and other investments turn the tide for families who are struggling to find affordable child care? Well, I think they're going to have a significant impact. Um, I think that one of the key priorities for me this year was to address um, the needs for families to be able to find child care when they need it and to have access to high quality child care um, so that their, their children are, are safe and, and healthy when, they're, um, when they have to go to work. Um, the the um, impact of what we're um, putting in place, I think, will have a, a huge impact on not only families being able to find um, a, more options for child care because we're increasing the, the reimbursement rates for the child care assistance program. Um, we're raising it to the 75th percentile, which is the federal government's recommendation. Um, and by doing that, parents will have access to maybe three out of four providers, whereas today they have access to maybe three out of ten providers. So it's a significant change. It will also help the providers themselves get you know, more closely reimbursed for the work that they do. Uh, the Great Start, um, the retention payments, um, those will be, I think, a game changer for providers. We've seen over the past couple of years, uh, we've had the, the supportive retention payments in place and providers uh, receive a monthly um, stipend or month, monthly payment um, and that has been allowing them to increase their compensation. Um, the average child care worker in Minnesota makes only around $13 an hour, which is not enough for them to even live on. Um, so, you know, I think this will make a significant difference. It won't change um, things completely, and we will still need to up, um, apply more resources if we want to really bring things to the level that, they're, that they need to be. Uh, equity is a theme that runs throughout this budget, and within this new law, there is a Health Equity Advisory and Leadership Council, an Equitable Health Care Task Force, a Cultural Communications Program, an Office of African American Health, an Office of American Indian Health, and that's just to name a few. What do you hope will be the result of these efforts? Well, I think that I hope that by these efforts we are uh, communicating that um, communities need to be a part of all of the solutions that we're um, trying to implement in Minnesota. Um, I think through the Department of Health, through these, uh, the 
actual items that you listed, um, you know, we will have ways to directly connect, connect with communities uh, where we're seeing the greatest health disparities. Uh, we know Minnesota has um, a lot of healthy people and we have, um, you know, ways of increasing health, but uh, we also see great disparities between uh, white Minnesotans and um, BIPOC families. And so by specifically calling out these different programs, we're, we're able to um, work with the communities directly to find the solutions. And that's the key, I think, is that we are asking communities, what do you need to better, um, to better meet your needs in terms of health, um, education, um, you know, access to services, what kind of services. And so that's, that's my hope through all of these programs that you know, we will be meeting their needs in a better way. What began as a healthcare affordability board that would have had the ability to impose fines in an effort to rein in healthcare costs has changed into a center within the Department of Health that will simply analyze healthcare costs. How might this analysis, this new information that will come from this center, be used to shape future policy? Well, I'm, I'm really pleased that we are able to establish this, this center in, at the Department of Health. Um, I think that we have in place today some, some resources to help us look at health economics, but this will really strengthen our ability to, to do it in a more um, in-depth and um, systemic way. Um, what I hope to have come out of this is um, analysis that will lead us to um, to better understand what is driving cost increases in our healthcare system, and then um, you know what are some potential solutions? How could we pot, um, potentially address these um, increases in healthcare costs? Um, and you know through the affordability board, we were hoping to have more of a mechanism to um, you know kind of address the those drivers in a um, more tactical way, but I think that this, this center will give us the start we need to, to understand um, the environment and understand um, the healthcare costs right now, and then we can work on you know, what are the ways we need to have in place to, to really um, put solution, solutions into place. Uh, one controversial provision in the new law is the extension of Minnesota care uh, to undocumented Minnesotans beginning in the year 2025. What is the rationale for providing subsidized health care benefits to people who live in Minnesota without documentation? Well, the rationale for me is that I think that, that we should be a state where all Minnesotans who are um, of the qualifying income um, have access to uh, a program that you know, allows them to access health care. Um, I think that in 2025 we'll, we will be able to say that for you know all low-income Minnesotans, if you qualify um, for medical assistance, you will be able to apply and, and be able to access uh, meaningful health care. Um, these are um, people who, in terms of the expanding it to the undocumented, um, the the people who are working in our communities, paying taxes. Um, they are doing some of the most important and, um, you know, really urgent needed, urgently needed jobs in our communities. And um, today, um, many, for many of them, there are, you know, huge cost barriers to accessing medical care when they need it. And that's not right and it's not good for, um, it's not good for people um, in living, you know, healthy lives. Um, nor is it good for our economy. Um, you know, we depend on people to go to work and, and be able to contribute, and, and this is a way to, to recognize that part of that is um, being able to access health care that you can afford. Uh, there was also a plan put forward this session that would raise the, qualify, the qualifying threshold for Minnesota Care so that more people would be able to access the plan. What came out of conference committee in the end is an actuarial study to look into the concept of a single-payer health plan option. What needs to be learned? Well, I think actually, uh, you know, a couple things came out of the bill. Um, one is a study of actual study and, and analysis of universal health care um, system costs and benefits. Um, this is something that has been discussed um, in the Senate for quite a long time, but we haven't been able to take action on it. Um, the other thing that I think is also really equally important or more important is that the, we will be studying and doing an actuarial analysis for a Minnesota Care public option 
that would be a specific uh, way to address health care costs for people today who who buy insurance but they basically they, they can't afford to use their insurance so this puts meaningful language in place to to study and uh, determine the implementation plan needed to, to make that public option happen. Uh, there's so much in this bill. We've only scratched the surface, but Senator Melissa Wicklin, I want to thank you for taking the time today. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate being able to talk about it. It's, it's been a great session and an important bill for me to work on. So thank you.